which the way it works is that someone from church, I'm not sure who, but someone contacts a bunch of local schools in the nearby area, and the schools give the church names of families that are in need. And the way the church serves them is we invite them in on a Sunday morning and walk them, not only give them groceries, but then they walk into another room and there's tables labeled with ages small all the way through high school. And these families get Christmas presents for their kids that they get to pick out that they may or may not have gotten otherwise. And then there's a cool breakfast after that. And then the cool part to me is they're invited to service after that. They're invited to come be a part of the church family and worship with us and hear the news. And this is cool because it not only serves people, but it gets people involved in serving too. Because Noel Sunday is pretty much all hands on deck. You've got people organizing the volunteers, telling them where to go. You've got host families, which is really cool to me because the host families walk the Noel families through the whole process and path of everything. And that's a chance to get to build a bond and a connection. You've got people working the groceries and toy room, probably even more volunteer jobs I'm forgetting. But also, not just people volunteering their time, but volunteering resources, donating groceries and toys. Those things don't just appear magically, to my knowledge. But the point is, the church makes a point to serve the Florissant and the North County community by not only filling material needs, but inviting them into service to hear the best news they can possibly hear, which is the gospel. And like I said earlier, we have no idea if they're possibly hearing that for the first time or not. And you can even serve your community right here at school. Last, last semester, we saw the launch of the Bridge the Gap ministry. And in writing and preparing for this, I took, got to spend some time texting class talking with the people that started that ministry, which is Rachel and Amanda. And it's such a cool story and a cool ministry they're doing. And it start, all started because Amanda wanted to do, start a nursing home ministry. And so she went and talked to Rachel, knowing that she had work, Rachel had worked in a nursing home before. And the heart behind this from both of them is that oftentimes residents of these homes can feel forgotten as they may or may not get visitors for whatever reason. And just life is so hard for them. I mean, imagine how you would feel. Like, I don't know about you, but I'm a pretty social person. So already getting up there in age, add some sort of ailment, and the fact that I may or may not be getting a ton of visitors, I would get lonely and get down quickly. And so what they do is this ministry goes and visits with these people and spends time just loving on them, pouring into them, showing them that they are loved and that they are important and that they do still hold value. And from what I've heard, these residents have let them know how much they are appreciated. And this is such a cool ministry right here at school, doing a really cool work and making a big impact on the people they serve and the community. And by the way, if you're interested in joining that ministry or going on those visits, talk to either one of them. I'm sure they'd love to have you. But this whole thing, this cool work they're doing, all started because one person had an idea and ran with it. All it, can, all it has to take is one spark and it can start a fire. So the question is, how do we serve our community? And to be honest, the answer is, it depends. It depends on what passions God has placed on your heart, what causes he has made important to you. And for example, if you have a certain passion or cause on your heart, like feeding the hungry or homelessness, find a way to serve there. Volunteer at a shelter, donate to a food pantry. There are so many different ways you can serve your community. You just have to find the one that works for you and find the one God has placed on your heart. Acts 1.8 says that we are to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And my charge to you today is this. In the midst of going to the ends of the earth, don't forget about your Jerusalem. I love all the different ways we have to do global ministry. And even here at school, we have three mission trips going out next month. And I'm so excited to hear how those go and learn about what happens on those. But we, there's so much work and ministry to be done in our own backyards that we can't forget about either. Use your gifts in your community. There are, and like we said, there are many ways to use your gifts, but we need to make sure we're using them in our community as well as going out to the ends of the earth. First, by adjusting our mindset, learning to love and embrace our community and see it for the, for the 
mission field and opportunity and gift that it is, then we put it into action. We go out and serve by volunteering, donating, maybe something else. But the point is you take action. You do something. And by doing these things, we bring God's light to our cities and show God to our communities. She graduated from McClure Senior High School in 2011 with hopes to pursue an education in criminal law. Ms. Phillips then continued education at Harris Stow State University, where she received a Bachelor's of Science in Criminal Justice with an emphasis in juvenile justice. All throughout her youth, she was raised under the foundation of the Church of God in Christ Christian Belief. During undergrad studies, Ms. Phillips served as a youth leader for Yes to God Ministries under Wellspring Methodist Church of Ferguson, Missouri. Her service with Yes to God led her to travel to Washington, D.C. to speak with elected officials as well as students at Harvard University on behalf of the youth in Ferguson. Miss Phillips is now a mother who strives to live and speak for the kingdom of God. She has recently completed her Christian leadership degree here at Central Christian College of the Bible. And after graduation, Miss Phillips plans to settle into her new home in Florida and begin taking courses to earn her master's in counseling and become a religious counselor. Ladies and gentlemen, Akaya Phillips. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you all give me a second and just take a moment to give reverence to God, I'd just like to say a quick prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I first and foremost like to thank you for giving me this opportunity, Lord God, to speak to people of your people, Lord God. I pray that you decrease me and you increase all of you, Lord God. And I pray that you allow the word and the message that you want to convey to touch hearts and to touch minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, today, I want to uh, just get you all on, I guess, where me and God is and about protection and how spiritual protection is just as important, important as our second rights to carry. As much as we like to carry weapons, we should also carry the weapon of God with us. Amen. Amen. Uh, so first, let's talk about one of my favorite people in the Bible, David. Uh, the story of David and Goliath. David was this, he wasn't the powerful king that we know him to be today. David was this small, young kid coming to just give lunch to his brothers when he heard this big beast taunting God, not even, he wasn't, Paul, I'm sorry, David wasn't even thinking, oh, he's making fun of the army. No, he's making fun of God. And that's where I get offended. And so he, he comes up to the battle and uh, Goliath is making fun of him, laughing at him. And David says, you have a sword, but all I have is my stick and my slingshot, my rock, and my slingshot, and that's what I'm going to defeat you with because I have all that I need and I have the power of God. And so uh, with just that, David went up to Goliath, killed Goliath, and won that famous battle, and it was all because of just his faith in God alone. How many of you think you can actually kill a giant with a rock? Raise your hand. Yo, okay, unless God is with you, unless you got the power of God, that's the only way I can see it happening. Um, so uh, the reason why I said that story is because it reminds me so much of Paul, uh, if you all don't mind going with me to Ephesians 6, 12 through 13. And I'm reading from the NLT version. It reads, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. 
Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. If, if we continue, if we come to the battle prepared, we won't need to worry when the battle comes. We will be looking for it. And so what I believe Paul is saying in this message is spiritual warfare is all around us. And if we look at things from the surface level, if we look at our, um, if we look at our problems with each other as, oh, this is just me having an interaction, a negative interaction with someone, it's more than that. And I just want to take us a little further to look into that. So I, I pulled up some definitions. Let's take a look at the definition of flesh and blood. The Oxford def definition of flesh is a soft substance that consists of muscle and fat that is found between the skin of animals or humans. Okay? The blood is a red liquid and, I'm sorry, a red liquid substance that circulates in the arteries and veins of humans and other animals. So by definition, Paul is saying that you and I is the flesh and blood, but he also says our pets. Now, side note, I know we all love our pets. I love my little Bella, but the enemy be using her too. Have you ever took your dog to use the bathroom outside and then they come right inside and use the bathroom and you like, that's nothing but the devil. I loose you Satan right now, okay? I know I'm not the only one that had that happen. I love my little Bella, but the enemy be using her, okay? <laughs> and I don't want him to use me. So I have to think, how do, how, do I, how do I gain myself back from being upset with my pet, you know? Um, so... What, what has really helped me, I recently moved to Florida, of course. I, I love Florida, I love the environment, and I'm just so excited. I started working for a nonprofit organization. Love this organization. We're supposed to be helping children in the community of uh, foster care, um, finding families. I'm traveling around through, all throughout the state of Florida, and I'm like, oh, I'm so excited. Yes, this is great. And then, bam. I have a coworker that I'm like, I don't, you know what, God, I know we're supposed to love everybody, but I just don't know about this person right here. Um, very, very loving, very inviting. Um, everyone on my team is very supportive. We are all for the mission. However, um, I noticed that one time I would meet with this young lady different times throughout the day, and I would always tell her, this is what I have, and this is what you can take back to the corporate office. And when she would take it back, it would be different than what I've had told her. And so I'm like, oh, you're changing my words to make it seem like I'm saying something that I'm actually not saying. And so it looks bad to my boss. And so I get angry and I get frustrated and I'm just like, I just start being nasty back. I'm going to be honest with y'all. Please don't judge me. Don't judge me. Yes, I was nasty with her every meeting. I'm like, I don't want to talk to you. Don't talk to me. Emails only. And then God was like, but that's not what I want from you. That's not who I called you to be. I'm like, but God, I've been trying to be so nice to her. I'm, I'm, I just, God was like, no. No. And then immediately Ephesians 6 and 12 came to mind. We do not battle with flesh and blood. And God immediately said, I need you to start praying for her. Now, how many people pray for their enemies? And don't lie. It's hard. It's hard. It is hard. If you raise your hand, amen. God bless you. I'm, I hope I get there. I'm still working on it. Um, but praying for your enemies is not the easiest thing, especially when your enemy is poking you. They're poking the bear. And so you're like, I'm trying to do the godly thing and pray for you, but you are asking for King Kong. You are not asking for the Lord. Um, and so one thing that helped me, though, honestly, since then, when I finally realized what was going on, I'm like, God, it's deeper than me. It's more than me and her having a back and forth. It is your child is hurting God. So how do I pray for her? 
How do I allow her to see your glory in what I do? How can she see you? Show me how you see her and then show me how to present myself. And that's what I feel Paul is saying with Ephesians. This is how we have to always come to every conversation that we have. So if you ever find yourself in a situation like this, like take a moment and think, have you been in a situation where you had someone that you had to work with, but you don't agree with? someone that is not nice to you, somebody that you are just like, I wish they would just leave, but they stay like a fly <laughs> that will not go away. Um, I, I, I encourage you to pray for them because as much as the enemy wants to use you, God also wants to use you in that moment. So I would always encourage to pray, 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 even when you feel like I want to be angry. I feel like it's best to be angry and go off. Sometimes that's not always the best answer. So let's take a further look into uh, verse 13 where Paul says, put on the full armor of God. So what is armor? If you can see on the screen behind me. Armor is the metal covering formerly worn by soldiers and warriors to protect the Bible. I'm sorry, to protect the body in battle. One thing I used to learn as a kid, there was a song called We Are Soldiers in the Army of the Lord. Uh, you, regardless if you think I would never go to war, you are in war whether you like it or not. Every day you wake up, it is a battle. It is a battle for God and it is a battle for authorities of these unseen, of the unseen world that we can't see, can't touch, but we know they're there. We call it spiritual warfare. So how do we protect our body? How do we use this armor? First Corinthians 3.16, Paul tells us, do you know that God's spirit dwells within you? So how do you protect the spirit that is dwelling on the inside of you? How do we do the necessary things to continue to protect our bodies from what the enemy wants to come against. One, you have to pray. Of course you have to pray. Of course you have to read. Of course you have to fast. But what does fasting consist of? What other things do we need to do to keep ourselves focused and stay on God? I always say eat. It's how you eat. Think about this. If God dwells on the inside of us and I'm always eating McDonald's, I'm going to feed God McDonald's every day? I'm going to give God chips and cookies and all type of food that can just cause different cancers and diseases. Is that what I'm going to feed God every day? What if God say, hey, I want you to get up and go take a 15-minute walk. Ooh, God, it's too cold outside. Mm -mm, I'm not doing that. Mm -mm. No, that's, that's, that's not what you want to give God. If we are Christians and believers of God, we always want to give God our full our full, I'm sorry, our full undivided attention, our full courage. We want to give him 100%, but we can't do that if we are just eating whatever we want to eat, not doing what God is asking us to do, not being obedient. The cost of obedience is a major cost, and I don't know if everyone realized that. As much as you don't want to do what you're being called to do, it can save not only your lives, but a lot of lives around you, and even think, God is dwelling in me. I would like for God to last. I would like for God, not last, I'm sorry. I would like for God to be heard. I would like for God to be known. How can God be known if I'm not nourishing him within me? You have to take care of you before you take care of others. Stand firm with the belt of truth around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. The truth is the word, the word of God. We shall wear it around our waist to use it against the enemy. The enemy tries to come with different plans. He comes with all sorts of devices to get us, and we always have to be mindful of that. Every, the flesh and blood, we just said the flesh and blood is human being, but it's also animals. So at any moment, the enemy can attack you. You can walk past and, oh, and fall. An embarrassment, the enemy will use that embarrassment to throw you off all day. And God probably was going to have you speak to somebody and say, I need you to go over there and say hi to somebody. And while you were on your way, you tripped and fell. Now you're embarrassed and you don't want to go say hi. That's the trick of the enemy, to try and get you off your game, to do 
what he wants you to do, which is not obey God. Stand, stand with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Again, that's where it comes where we have to continue to read our word. As long as you know the word of God, there is nothing that can come against you. Trust me, the world's logic may make you think that what you are doing for God sounds crazy. That's why God has the scripture, lean not unto thine own understanding. Because a lot of things that God calls us to do sometimes don't make sense. Let's think about Noah. There was no rain whatsoever seen for years when Noah started building this boat. They laughed at Noah. But what Noah say, I heard what God said. I'm going to lean on what God said. I know what God said. That was his moment to stand still and say, this is what God said. I'm going to do what God told me to do. No matter what anybody said, his mom probably came up and said, son, a boat? I don't know. We had rain in a long time. He said, yeah, but I know what God said. And God told me to build this boat. And God told me that this would save my family. And I bet when they seen that boat going by, they was like, he was right. Looking silly, looking real silly. One person that I would say absorbs this, all, all of these scriptures would be my mother. My mother is a very strong lady, very, very strong lady. I've never seen her cry, uh, probably, once, probably a few times I've seen my mother cry. And the reason why I bring her up is because I feel like she would be the perfect example as to how this scripture should be lived out. Um, as a child, I grew up, she was a single mom. I grew up with four siblings. I am the youngest of four. And she, she would always be on us about going to church, going to church. We got to go to church every day. I'm like, oh. I, t I grew up Kojic, and if you know anything about Kojic, they are always in church. They're in church from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., and then you leave, and you go back, and you're back at church. And I just used to be like, why are we in church so much? Oh, my gosh. I don't think God likes seeing us so much. Um, <laughs> but but, but she, she knew, again, she stood flat-footed. She knew what God was saying. She, didn't, she wasn't listening to what we had to say. So, but then there was a moment where I noticed that my mom had a crack in her foundation. Um, I want to say it was 2010, she lost her mother to breast cancer, and then five years later, she lost her father. And then from 2018 to 2021, it just seemed like a world storm. She lost two sisters and a husband all in that time span. She would, she would come out with the family and she would still be laughing and still be talking and everyone is looking around like something's wrong, something's off, she, she's not okay, you, you need to go seek help, you, it's not okay. Like people would come to her and say, it's not okay that you're not crying. And she was like, I don't need to cry, God has already showed me everything that I needed to see and I'm going to be okay. But we were still saying, you're not okay, you just lost the most people that you've known in your life. These are your sisters, this is your husband, this is your parents that you just lost. You can't be okay. But she still continued to step footed, have her feet set footed and said, no, I am okay, nothing is wrong. And so I commend her for that. I commend her so much because what she did was she heard her family's cry Hey, we think you need help, but she heard God's voice louder. She listened to the voice of God. She stayed in tune with God. She would go into her secret hot, she would go into her secret place, go into her room, stay there and pray for hours and days. And of course, the world would tell us isolation is never a good thing. But how many times did Jesus go and isolate himself from the disciples? Isolate himself so he can pray and reconnect with God. None of us are God. None of us can recharge her the way God could. And so she knew that and she stood on God's word heavily, very heavily. So was I offended when she said, 
no, I don't, I'm okay. I was not offended at all. That, met, that let me know again that she is strong and she was a true believer in God. And so I'm hoping that just like her, all of us today will listen to Paul's word, hold on to the fullness of God. Think of Ephesians, when that one person comes up to you and say, hey, let me borrow a pencil, knowing you don't like them, Think Ephesians 6 and 12, for we do not battle with flesh and blood. And if you have an extra pencil, just let them use the extra pencil. It is okay. God will bless you with tooth. God supplies all your needs through his riches and glory. He has more than enough pencils to provide you with. Don't allow the enemy to get you off your rocker and make you think that being mean is better than glorifying God and showing love to one another because that's what God wants the most for us. So be protected. Allow his, I pray that his love covers you and I pray that he is with you. Thank you. If you guys could stand and worship with us.
Let's turn on the lights. Thanks. Um, first of all, I want to thank you guys all for just being here and sharing in chapel with us today. And I really want to say thank you to any guests or visitors that we had either here or online that have participated. What a joy it is for me to hear our seniors as they're bringing this accumulation of of what they're participating in, the ministry they're participating in, and where God's leading them through right now. So I was very encouraged by both Bruce and Ikea. Thank you very much for your messages. Those were well-timed and, yeah, super messages. Um, I also want to thank everybody else who had a part in putting Chappie on today. Let's thank our worship team. I thought they did a, a great job. And, and I really appreciate of Jonathan wearing his high visibility jacket today. I felt much safer knowing that that he was everybody was able to see us, you know, clearly we weren't in any danger. So uh, that was really that was really nice. I'd like to uh, say a prayer for the community here before we uh, we dismiss. Father God, you are awesome and holy. What an incredible gift it is to share in the community of faith. And then to be encouraged by those, Father, who are stepping out in ministry and in kingdom activity, guiding us and helping us and encouraging us to do the same. We love you, Father. I praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Before you leave, let me tell you, Kaya's mother is here with us today as well. You heard her talk. And she brought uh, several... Um, uh, breast cancer awareness packages and they're over on that table there today so we invite you to grab one of those as you leave today thank you very much oh yeah they're on both sides so thank you very much i was in darkness all of my life